They're called airbags. The optional swing-away steering wheel moves over to welcome you in. Tight T-bar roof available on Aspen Coupes. Have you ever wondered about the evolution of car safety? Have you ever wondered about the dangerous old car features that faded into history? If you knock someone over in a car, it's bad. But if you knock someone over in that, they were kidneys, liver, offal. Oh. From daring ideas to remarkable advancements, automotive history is a captivating journey of change. Four-speed transmission. You can get power steering, power brakes, even air conditioning. Mustang was designed to be designed by you. Discover how these fascinating developments have shaped the safer vehicles we drive today. Join us as we look at 13 dangerous old car features that faded into history. The flying car makes its first test. A propeller-driven automobile that also flies, or if you prefer it the other way, a plane that also doubles as a car. Propeller-driven cars in the 1940s and 50s aimed to mix road travel with aviation. These experimental cars, like the Helica by Marcel Layat, the Schlorwagen and Italy's Era Auto PL5C were equipped with aircraft-style propellers. The vision was for these cars to fly through the skies and cruise on the highways. But the dream of flying cars quickly turned dangerous. The exposed rotating blades posed severe safety risk, threatening passengers and pedestrians. With propellers that could cause injury upon contact, these cars also suffered from control issues, especially at low speeds on the ground about this because it's got the massive whirling propeller but they've put these thin bits of wire so nobody could accidentally put their hand through or their head or anything <laughs> like that see yeah I can't despite their excitement these propeller driven cars were produced in minimal quantities high profile accidents like the 1935 fire that injured inventor Konstantinos Vlachos highlighted the dangers these incidents along with the inherent instability of the design led to a decline in interest the lack of commercial success and funding further reduced their development. Looking as ready to fly away as Mr. Newman's butterflies is the world's first ever propeller-driven car, the homemade invention of 32-year-old Clifford Robbins of Yeovil, Somerset. By the 1950s, these experimental vehicles were phased out, overtaken by more practical and safer automotive technologies. While the concept of flying cars remains a topic of fascination, the propeller-driven cars of the mid-20th century serve as a reminder of the risk involved in blending aviation and automotive technology. The propeller car can do 70 miles an hour when the police aren't watching and 60 miles to the gallon. Altogether, it costs 200 pounds and six months hard work to build. Propeller-driven cars were a short-lived experiment. Their decline was inevitable as the focus shifted towards more reliable and less harmful automotive advancements. Remember those early car interiors where the complex, unforgiving metal dashboards were considered a safety hazard? Thinking beyond crash helmets and safety belts, there may be an enormous market for suits of armor. Metal dashboards made from steel or aluminum, often with a wood grain or painted finish, were standard in cars in the 40s and 50s. They were designed to be durable and functional, supporting components like the steering column and instrumentation. While designed for durability, these complex dashboards pose serious risk and accidents. In a crash, the metal could cause severe injuries like broken bones and head trauma. Drivers and passengers had little protection against the unforgiving surface. The problematic nature of these dashboards made them a severe hazard in the event of a collision. Safety improvements came in the late 50s with the introduction of padded dashboards. These padded versions started as optional equipment but eventually became standard by the mid-60s. Automakers began prioritizing safety and moved away from hard metal to more forgiving materials. Padded dashboards helped to absorb impact energy, which reduced the risk of severe injuries and crashes. Increased safety regulations and consumer demand for safer interiors drove the shift away from metal dashboards. The industry recognized the need for designs that protected occupants better in accidents. This led to the widespread adoption of padded dashboards and other safety features. The last metal dashboard was on U.S. Beetles in 1967. Although metal dashboards were stylish and durable, they were also dangerous. The shift to padded dashboards improved car safety, protecting passengers from severe injuries during collisions. Get ready to explore the dangerous design of rigid and sharp hood ornaments. 
They would buy a specific hood ornament to put on their car. And that was really popular in the 50s and 60s. It was also popular in the 20s and 30s. The culture of hood ornaments was introduced in 1912 when Boyce Motometer Company made a radio cap thermometer. It soon became a focal point for automobile companies to personalize hood ornaments for their vehicles. Hood ornaments were popular from the 1940s to the 1960s. These metal ornaments featured stylish designs that proudly displayed the car brand. They were often made from brass or chrome-plated steel and placed on the car's front, showing the expensive brand and catching people's eyes. They're vanishing by the thousands. Yes, hood ornaments. What used to be simple car decoration has now become fashion for belt buckles or necklaces. While flashy, these rigid ornaments pose serious dangers. Because of their sharp nature, they could cause severe injuries, including puncture wounds or deep cuts in a collision with a pedestrian. These poked out designs were a safety risk as they could easily harm or strike pedestrians, leading to potentially life-threatening injuries. By the late 60s, concerns over these threats led to safer designs. Hood ornaments became collapsible to avoid possible injuries. With the 1968 model year, new designs were introduced that allowed the ornament to retract upon impact, reducing the risk of injury. How many ornaments have you sold this year? Uh, I checked a while ago, it was 392. That's for all cars, all Cadillacs. The transition to safer hood ornaments marked a shift in automotive design priorities. The focus moved from purely aesthetic considerations to include pedestrian safety. As a result, the traditional hood ornament disappeared from new vehicle designs by the 1970s. Hood ornaments were stylish and iconic, but their sharp edges made them dangerous. The shift to collapsible designs was a significant advancement in car design. Next is the jet age design elements of the 1950s and 60s, where style sometimes overshadowed safety. The term jet age was first introduced in the late 1940s when jet-powered aircraft was introduced. The jet age brought sleek modern designs to cars in the 50s and 60s. Imagine cars with tail fins, sharp front grills, and raised roofs. Inspired by jet airplanes, these features made cars look modern, which showcased the spirit of innovation. Though modern, these design elements had safety issues. Tail fins and pointed grills were often sharp and sticking out. In the case of accidents, they could cause severe injuries to pedestrians. The stylish but dangerous features were a significant concern as they added unnecessary risk to vehicle design. Atomic powered rocket boosters, in fact, it didn't have a motor of any kind. These were only a styling touch. The popularity of these designs peaked in the late 50s and early 60s. By the mid-60s, safety concerns and changing consumer taste led to more practical car designs. The sharp decorative elements faded and were replaced by safer, more functional features. Automakers and designers began to prioritize safety over aesthetics. Consumer demand pushed for changes that improved pedestrian and occupant safety. Jet-age design elements made cars look cool but posed severe safety risks. The shift towards safer designs marked an essential step in the automotive world. This balanced style and the need for improved safety. Get ready to learn about the classic bench seats from the 1940s to the 80s and their safety challenges. We talk a lot about a bench seat and, and uh, you know, it's kind of snuggling up to your date or yeah, to your, yeah. your special I miss those someone. Days. I know, it was kind of fun. <laughs> bench seats were added in cars from the 1940s to the 1980s. This feature was first introduced in vehicles like Willys Aero and Nash Motors Airliner in 1952. It was featured in many American cars like the 1957 Chevy Bel Air and the 1963 Ford Galaxy 500. These full-width seats allowed three people to sit in the front row, making them famous for their spaciousness. Some even folded into beds, adding to their appeal for road trips and extra seating. Although bench seats define travel comfort, they also had some safety drawbacks. They offered little sideways support, making it easier for passengers to be thrown around during accidents or sharp turns. This lack of side support increased the risk of injuries during accidents. The passengers could collide with each other or the interior of the car. As safety standards evolved, 
Bucket seats became more popular in the 1960s. Bucket seats provided better support and were seen as sportier and more compatible. They offered individual seating, which reduced the risk of injury by keeping passengers more securely in place. So we have to be cognizant of that. You have to have seat belts. A lot of these cars, if you notice, there are no seat belts in this car. Sure. Um, it wasn't required. By the 1980s, most passenger vehicles had replaced bench seats with bucket seats for better safety. The move was also influenced by the introduction of seat belts and airbags, which were more effective with bucket seats. Trucks had retained bench seats for a while longer, but the trend was clear. Even though the bench seats were roomy and convenient, they could have been safer. The transition to bucket seats improved passenger protection. Next, are you thrilled to explore the rigid steering wheels, which pose serious safety risk in accidents? Or maybe the Triumph Spitfire. Any fit. Perhaps in your case, a closed car. The Triumph 1500TC. Let's go. French engineer Alfred Vacheron added the first steering wheel to a car in 1894 on his Panhard racing car. Initially, it was mechanical and could only be pulled left or right. From the 1940s to the 1960s, steering wheels were rigid. They were made from hard materials like metal or wood and provided a direct connection to the steering column. While they were sturdy, they had a significant safety flaw. In a collision, these rigid steering wheels could cause severe chest injuries. The hard surface and lack of energy absorption meant drivers faced the risk of broken ribs and internal injuries. Frontal crashes were particularly dangerous, as the steering wheel could become a deadly object in the scenario of misfortune. The late 1960s brought an innovation, collapsible steering wheels. These new designs absorbed impact energy, reducing the risk of injury. By the mid-1970s, collapsible steering wheels became the industry standard, vastly improving driver safety. This change was driven by increasing vehicle safety awareness and regulatory pressure to improve crash protection. While rigid steering wheels were once the norm, their dangers led to new advancements. Collapsible steering wheels provided much needed protection, marking a key milestone in car safety. Empower your understanding of T-top roofs, which offered style but compromised structural integrity. There's a new out-of-sight T-bar roof available on Aspen Coupes. Remove the tinted glass panels and Aspen has the open-air feeling of a convertible. The T-top roof was first introduced in the 1948 Tasco prototype car designed by Gordon Burig. It was not seen again until 1968 when Chevrolet introduced it as an option on the C3 Corvette. T-top roofs were all the rage in the 1970s and 80s, especially on sports cars. They featured two removable roof panels, creating a T shape when installed. They, people usually tend to steal the T-tops. These are very expensive parts of the car that are very easily removable. Drivers love the open air experience they provided, offering a convertible-like feel without sacrificing the structural integrity of a hardtop. T-tops had a severe downside. Their design weakened the car's structure, increasing the risk of collapse in a rollover accident. The removable panels introduced points of weakness, compromising safety. In a rollover, the car's roof could fail to provide protection, leading to severe injuries and casualties. With time, the safety standards improved, and the popularity of T-tops began to decline. Automakers moved towards more vital roof designs and safer alternatives like Targa roofs, which offered a similar open-air experience with better structural durability. By the late 1980s, T-tops were completely phased out. T-top roofs were stylish but unsafe. The shift to more structurally sound designs was necessary to improve vehicle safety. This step reflected the industry's growing commitment to protecting occupants in all types of crashes. Now imagine this, the creative yet risky swing-away steering wheel of the 1960s, designed to enhance entry and exit ease. See? Lift the lever, it adjusts to seven different positions. It's a marvelous age we live in. Great century to know a Chevrolet dealer. Come on. Ford first introduced the swing-away steering wheel on the 1961 Ford Thunderbird. This unique design allowed the steering wheel to move sideways, making getting in and out of the car easier. It was a novel idea aimed at improving convenience, especially for drivers who found traditional steering wheels difficult. 
Yet the swing-away steering wheel had a dangerous flaw. If it moved while driving, the driver could lose control of the car. This unexpected movement could cause accidents, making it a significant safety risk. The mechanism that allowed the wheel to swing could fail at any moment, which led to sudden and unpredictable changes in the vehicle's direction. Due to these dangers, the swing-away steering wheel was short-lived. It was available for only a few model years before being discontinued. Ford returned the conventional fixed steering wheel designs to ensure driver safety. The advanced idea was ahead but ultimately proved to be too risky for widespread use. It was an innovative but risky feature. Its potential to cause loss of control led to its quick failure in favor of safer steering options. This highlighted the need for thorough safety testing of new automotive designs. Have you ever wondered about the hidden dangers of asbestos brake pads? The next chapter will provide an eye-opening and insightful exploration. Breathing asbestos can cause cancer, but so can ingesting asbestos, which often happens accidentally when people have their mouths open around asbestos dust. As car speeds increased, asbestos was commonly used in brake pads, starting in the 1920s and continuing after World War I. They were ubiquitous in cars from the 1940s to the 1980s. Asbestos brake pads were valued for their durability and heat resistance, making them practical for braking under various conditions. It could withstand high temperatures and provided excellent friction, making it an ideal material for brake pads. Asbestos poses severe health risks. When disturbed, such as during brake pad replacement, it releases harmful fibers into the air. Mechanics and drivers inhaling these fibers face severe health issues, including asbestosis and mesothelioma, a fatal form of cancer. The risks were exceptionally high for automotive workers who frequently handled these materials. Mesothelioma is the most notorious disease linked to asbestos exposure. By the 1980s, the dangers of asbestos were widely recognized. Regulations were introduced to phase out asbestos brake pads. Countries worldwide began to ban or restrict the use of asbestos in automotive products. Safer alternatives like ceramic and semi-metallic brake pads became the standard. These new materials provided similar performance without the health risks. The transition to safer materials was driven by increasing awareness of the health issues associated with asbestos. Automotive manufacturers responded by developing and adopting new technologies to protect workers and consumers. Asbestos brake pads were effective but harmful. The switch to safer materials marked an essential step in protecting the health of mechanics and drivers, reflecting the industry's commitment to safety. Dive into the early days of airbag deployment, where the technology's initial forcefulness posed unexpected risks. There you are. <laughs> They're called airbags, and in the event of a head-on collision, they take less than half a second to deploy. Airbags were a groundbreaking safety feature introduced in the early 1980s. They were designed to protect drivers and passengers by blowing up quickly during frontal crashes. The idea was to provide a cushion to reduce the impact on occupants, preventing serious injuries. The first generation airbags had a significant flaw. They deployed with excessive force, sometimes causing injuries, especially to more minor occupants and children. The rapid inflation could lead to wounds, bruises, and even fractures. Children sitting too close to the airbag module or riding in the front seat were especially risky. As the dangers became known, improvements were made. Automakers reduced the deployment force and added advanced sensors to detect the size and position of occupants. These sensors helped ensure that airbags deployed at appropriate speeds and pressures, reducing the risk of injury. By the mid-1990s, second-generation airbags with safer deployment features became standard. Several incidents, such as the deaths of children in low-speed crashes, highlighted the dangers of early airbags. This started a public awareness campaign. These tragic events, along with lawsuits and regulatory pressure, rushed the development of safer airbag systems and led to recommendations for children to ride in the rear seats. Early airbags were well-intentioned but risky inventions. Enhancements over time made airbags much safer and vital parts of vehicle safety systems. It's not for flaws, but inspect it with your hands for the curved strength of its steel and the grace of its body. 
You take pleasure in its fine point. Door latches in cars from the 1940s to the 1960s were highly unreliable and often poorly designed, leading to significant safety concerns. Door locks on convertibles and roadsters from 1935 to 1940 were especially problematic, as they were only partially intended for closed-body vehicles. These door latches had two significant issues. They could open unexpectedly during crashes or jam shut, trapping occupants inside. If a door opened during a collision, occupants could be ejected from the vehicle, increasing the risk of severe injury or death. On the other hand, if a door jammed shut, it could prevent occupants from escaping in emergencies such as fires. The dangers posed by these faulty latches were significant. They were unexpectedly opening doors during a collision, exposing occupants to the threat of being thrown from the vehicle, a high risk in a severe crash. Jammed doors could trap occupants, making them unable to escape quickly in emergencies, further endangering their lives. Despite the dangers, improved door latch mechanisms were widely introduced in the 1970s. As the car safety standards evolved, automakers and regulators prioritized occupant safety, developing more reliable and secure door latches. This transition was a broader movement towards enhancing vehicle safety during the 1970s and beyond. Door latches used in cars in the 1940s through the 60s were often poorly designed and prone to failure. Next on the risk list is steering column's impalement. So even though it's late model technology and a 14 to 1 ratio, it bolts right into an early Chevy without any real modification. The steering column's impalement was introduced in 1967 by General Motors in Chevrolet models. In the 50s and 60s, steering columns were rigid and non-collapsible. These columns directly connected to the steering wheel to the car's wheels, providing precise control. However, this design had a serious flaw. Before the late 60s, car steering columns were rigid and could be very dangerous in a crash. They could puncture drivers, causing severe injuries or even death. The stiff steering wheel hubs, often designed with a bullet nose cap, added to the risk of head and chest injuries. These early steering columns lack safety features like energy-absorbing mechanisms, making them dangerous during accidents. In the late 1960s, new collapsible steering columns were introduced. These designs absorbed impact energy, significantly reducing the risk of stab and serious injuries. By the mid-70s, collapsible steering columns became the industry standard driven by increased public awareness and new regulations pushing for better vehicle safety. The shift to collapsible steering columns represented a significant advancement in automotive safety. They provided essential protection for drivers and crashes. While non-collapsible steering columns were once standard, they were dangerous. The introduction of collapsible designs significantly improved safety, showing a critical improvement in protecting drivers. Now let's listen to the history of drum brakes and their limitations. Grip at 50 miles an hour, one like this has to move 12 pints of water per second. The drum brake was introduced in 1902 by French engineer Louis Renault. From the 1940s to the 1960s, drum brakes were the standard car braking system. They worked by pressing brake shoes against the inside of a drum attached to the wheel, creating friction to slow down the vehicle. This design was simple and cost-effective to manufacture. But drum brakes had several drawbacks. They could have been more effective at stopping vehicles quickly, particularly in wet conditions or during repeated heavy braking. They were also prone to overheating and brake fade, reducing their effectiveness. The enclosed drum design made it challenging to eliminate heat, leading to uneven wear of the brake linings and drums. In the 1960s, disc brakes were introduced and quickly gained popularity. They offered better performance in heat dissolution, providing more consistent braking under various conditions. Disc brakes became the preferred choice due to their superior stopping power and reliability. In from the Hendon Police College is the newest brainwave in brakes, the disc brake. It's a large metal disc, vertical and running with a wheel. Needs no adjustment, resists heat and water. Stricter safety regulations and consumer demand for improved braking performance increased the adoption of disc brakes. By the late 60s, many cars had switched from drum to disc brakes, especially on the front wheels, where braking demands are the highest. Even though drum brakes were widely used, they had several performance issues. 
so the transition to disc brakes greatly improved vehicle braking systems, enhancing driver's safety and performance.